So I think now we can start uh, because uh, people are coming in and we can start it so that whoever comes they can join us in due course. So I welcome all the audience to today's Astro Adda program. Uh, this particular program, this Astro Adda is a joint initiative of Regional Science Centre and Planetarium Calicut and Public Outreach and Education Committee of the uh, Astronomical Society of India. We do this program every month and uh, we bring one astronomer uh, and uh, speak something uh, in such a way that it is understandable to all the persons. And this particular program is distinct from a popular talk program in the sense that it is an astro adda in the sense that people can actually interact with the visitors, uh, with the speaker and um, they can ask questions, they can uh, ask their doubt, they can stop the thing. It is practically like an informal uh, discussion. That's what uh, we intend to do. And uh, uh, normally uh, what is done is that uh, as the talk goes on, unless you have very specific, uh, means you, if you feel that you have to ask something, you can interrupt the speaker. Otherwise we uh, do actually, we at the end, we have a question answer session where you can uh, put up all your uh, queries and uh, uh, our speaker mm -hmm. gladly answers all these queries so uh, today's thing let us start today's uh, topic uh, in, in astronomy for uh, means uh, relativity for uh, everyone and uh, everybody knows that Einstein did something astonishing and this was what was written by Burton Russell in his opening passage of ABC of relativity which was published in 1925 then he continues that very few people know exactly what it was it is generally recognized that he revolutionized our conception of the physical world, but the new concepts are wrapped up in mathematical technicalities and it is true that there are innumerable popular account of the theory of relativity, but they, are gen they generally cease to be intelligible just at the point where they begin to say something important. And uh, today uh, we, will, uh, 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 we have with us Professor Naresh Dadich. Uh, I will uh, just introduce the professor uh, 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 through his uh, small uh, profile. Nare, professor Naresh Dadich was born in a small village in Rajasthan and studied at various places, uh, Pilani, Nasar, Vallabh, Vidyanagar and Pune. He did his PhD in general relativity at Pune University and then joined ma uh, mathematics faculty there. In 1988, he, uh, he teamed with Professor Jayant Narlikar to establish Ayuka and succeeded him as director in 2003. Since 2009, he is an emeritus professor at Ayuka and in 2012, he took up M.A. Ansari chair in the chair of theoretical physics, Jamia Melia Islamia, New Delhi. He also holds research chair, honorary research chair in the School of Mathematics, University of Kawazulu Natal, Durban, South Africa. His main field of interests are relativistic astrophysics and cosmology, black hole uh, energetics, gravitational theories in higher dimension. Published over 250 papers and edited several conference proceedings. Has, he has been the council member of International Relativity Society and president of Indian Association of General Relativity and Gravitation. Besides scientific research, he also has keen interest in the issue of wider social relevance and interacts, interaction between society and science. So I welcome Professor to this uh, gathering and uh, Sir now please uh, you can start your talk. <clears throat> Thank you very much. It's, it's, it's wonderful to uh, interact with the people and it would be really nice to come over in person and have a live, live session. But as the situation is, we have to do with the, whatever is possible in the virtual space. <clears throat> So let me, and I m must say, uh, greetings to all my Calicut friends that uh, I very fondly remember my last visit and also to your center at Nimratoka. Yes. 
So I start sharing the screen. Do you see it? Yeah, yeah, fine. It's fine. Fine. <clears throat> okay. So before I begin, the, so this was the talk I had put together in 2005 when <clears throat> we were celebrating 100 years of special relativity or that uh, 1905 particular year of uh, in which Einstein did this very interesting monumental work. And that on June 18th, Professor Abel Kumar Rajodri of uh, Presidency College, he passed away. Now, Professor Rai Chaudhary, for us relativists in India, was a legendary iconic figure. As a matter of fact, so long a general relativity stage, Rai Chaudhary equation stage. Rai Chaudhary gave an equation which governs the dynamics of the universe. And <coughs> So he was a, a friend, philosopher, and guide to my generation of relativists. And he was a great friend of our institute, Ayuka. So uh, this is, talk is dedicated to his own memory. <coughs> now let's start. <coughs> so let's, let us see. So when you give a talk like this, you try to pick up something, a catchy title. And what could be a catchier than this to say, why Einstein? Why do we need him? And then we say, okay, also give a little spin to it. Had I been born in 1844? Well, both these things will come together with, as I go ahead. <clears throat> so this is my affiliation. Right? So <clears throat> let us begin from a very simple concept uh, and a, a totally a common sense uh, uh, definition for this. And that is to say universality. Now you might ask, what do I mean by universality? Again, very. <clears throat> Uh, the simple common sense uh, idea that by universal we mean anything which is same for all, shared by all. So it's in the equally shared and which means the same thing to everyone. <clears throat> now this if you have, then you will let's ask the next question. <clears throat> What are such universal things we know of? And obvious answer is the primary universal entities we know of are space and time. Both are the same for all, they are equally shared, and so they qualify to be universal in our definition of universality. Next question comes, <clears throat> if both of them are universal, they must be on the same footing. What do we mean by that? <clears throat> that whatever is true for space, the same thing should be true for time. So for example, that we all know that the distance between two points is observer dependent. So you have the two points here, 
The distance you measure will depend upon what path you take. And it will be the shortest when the you, you go, go from one point to other point in a straight line. Else you could do this. If, if you take a zigzag path, the distance you will measure will be larger. So <clears throat> the distance between the two spatial points depends on the path you take from going from one point to the other point. So this is, this is a common sense experience every day we know. <clears throat> Particularly when we are uh, traveling in an auto rickshaw or a taxi, we are all alert to see the driver takes the, so, the straight line path, doesn't do the looping around. Now, <clears throat> Now that the, next, the next question comes is, this is what happens for the spatial distance. And since space and time both are universal, they must be on the same footing. The same things, same should be true for the temporal distance. That is the distance between two events should also be path dependent. <clears throat> now, this is something which is not an everyday experience. But this very simple logic tells us that if it, this happens for the spatial distance, the same thing must happen for the temporal distance. So, for example, what you go have with, so what does this mean? It means that, say in the morning, you come to attend the classes in the college or school. There is a one clock you carry on your hand. There is one clock back at, at your home, in your drawing room. Now in the morning, the event, the morning when you left home, and after attending the college, in the afternoon when you go back, your clock which you are carrying with you has taken a different path than the clock at home. Because the clock at home has not moved at all. It is stationary there in your drawing room. Whereas the clock which you are carrying with you it has moved from your home to the college and then back to home. So this is exactly the situation like what we had for the spatial distance. Something like this. The one is straight, the other is you go. So here as you see the two distances, uh, the two, two measurements of distance are different. So similarly, you should, one should expect, oh sorry, that the, the clock at home and clock you are carrying, they should measure different times between these two events. <clears throat> but now you say, but now we see the clocks that they seem to measure the same time. So now from this, what conclusion do you draw? There are three possible things. One is that yes, the clocks measure the same, you have this. That means there is something wrong with our this very simple concept of universality. We have to give this up. But this looks so very obvious. And there is, so that doesn't, other maybe, <coughs> that the clocks are, clocks may be running differently. They are not very good. So, but you can have the clocks also very good. And then third possibility could be that as a matter of fact, there is a difference between the two, but the difference is so small 
that it is visible only on the tenth dec decimal place of the second, which our clocks don't measure. For them, especially, let us try to. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, now it's okay. Shall I continue? Yeah, yeah. Please continue. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So now here let us consider a one thought experiment. It's no longer a thought experiment. It is actually you could say. There are two friends A and B. A sits in a rocket and goes out for a space journey with a constant speed. <clears throat> and he has been told that every six minutes he should send a light signal back to B, who is at uh, who is at rest at home. So every six minutes he is sending a light signal back. <coughs> And A is going out with a constant speed. So the first signal will take some time, but the cons consequent signal will have the same interval between them, because that A is going out with the same speed. Now, the B will receive those signals at what interval? A is sending them out for every six minutes. So B will receive them at interval less than six minutes or more or the same. Now the usually I would have asked you to zoom it now you that's that's not possible. So let me give you a simple answer that it will be more because every time the A is going away, so light signals is going to take longer and longer to reach. But this interval at B will also be the constant. So let us say the speed of A is such that magnifying factor is 3 by 2. So B will receive this signal every 9 minutes. <coughs> A has to go for one hour according to his clock. So he will send 10 signals, 6 minutes each. Last signal for his outward journey, he will send out, will be received by B after 90 minutes. Because the B receives these signals every 9 minutes, 10 signals, so 90 minutes. Now after one hour, a reverses this direction and comes back home with the same speed. And again he is sending signals every six minutes. And they are being received by B. Now at what interval B will receive those signals in the from the back backward journey? <coughs> so well the symmetry of the situation will say tells you that she's coming back with the same speed. So the magnifying factor now gets reversed by two thirds. So B will receive these signals every four minutes. And again, 10 signals after two hours of this journey of according to A, the two meet. And when they meet, they compare their uh, clocks. So B says, you took 90 minutes to go out, you took only 40 minutes to come back. So B's clock reads 130 minutes. <clears throat> what does A say? I said I went with the same speed for one hour and came back with the same speed uh, for another hour. So, I took 60 minutes to go out 
<coughs> and 60 minutes to come back. So, age clock reached 120 minutes. Whereas the beach clock reached 130 minutes. This brings out the point we wanted if the two clocks take different paths between two events, then they must be differently. So, age clock goes like this and comes in a, sorry, uh, 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 as this travels in the space and it comes back. This clock remains stationary and so it's clock. So, these two, so this brings that the a, the space and time both are on the same footing. Whatever happens to the spatial distance, <coughs> the same happens to temporal distance if the clocks take different parts. So that's, that was the one thing which you have to see. However, in this figure, there is one thing that should surprise you. You are not used to this kind of thing. And here is the, this triangle. And the sum of the two triangles, sorry, sum of the two sides of a triangle is always larger than the, the third one. Here seems to be happening something opposite. The sum of the two sides is less than the third one, <coughs> which tells you the space and time, they do not combine as, as the distance relation like dx squared plus dy squared. Where the space and time, they combine as dt squared minus dx squared. And that is why the geometry here we have for the space time, it is a hyperbolic geometry not the Euclidean geometry. Okay. <clears throat> Once having brought the space and time on the same footing, now let's ask the next question. If there are two things, if they are both universal, can they be independent? Now, <clears throat> How do we know that things are independent of each other? And that the criteria for this is that you, you should be able to identify some property which is true for the one and not true for the other. <coughs> now, can this happen for two universal things? So we need to have a, some feature that distinguishes one from the other. If the both things are universal, then we cannot be, we should not be able to identify a feature which is true for the one and not true for the other. Because that feature will break the universality. So, in a, 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 a simple example, for example, you could say Mahatma Gandhi, Gautam Bodh, these are some universal, universal people, persons. They are both universal. Now, <laughs> there's since they are both universal, they must be both of the, they must both be connected through something universal. And we all know that what connects Gautam Buddha and uh, Mahatma Gandhi is the concept of peace, the, the universal value of peace. So similarly here, space and time are both universal, 
Hence, they cannot be independent. So no two universal things can be independent of each other. They must be related, and that relation must also be universal. So now we come to a very important conclusion that space and time cannot be independent, they must be related. And what should that relation be? So we want a relation between space and time. And of course we all know <coughs> the simplest relation between which connects space and time is velocity. That's how you define the space over time, distance travel in per unit time is what you call that velocity. So it's a velocity which relates space and time. But the next question is more important. And that is to say that this velocity which connects space and time must be universal. Because the universal things can only be connected through universal relation. So this relation between space and time must be universal. What does it mean? It means that, <coughs> that there must exist a universal velocity which is the same for all. Now, this is something very crazy. In our everyday life, or your Newton's law of mechanics tell us that no velocity could be universal. Velocity depends from the observer. So, if our, this simple argument is true, right here, we have a new thing that our all physics, all Newtonian framework cannot be true because that cannot admit a universal velocity. So the reason for this is the velocities add like W at U plus V. If something is moving relative to U with a velocity U, and something else is moving relative to the observer u with velocity v, then the velocity of the second thing relative to u will be u plus v. And so, it, according to Newton's mechanics, no velocity could be universal. But our universality of space and time dictates that there must exist in the universe a universal velocity. So, <clears throat> if that is the case, then if our very crazy logic tells us that we need a new mechanics right here. This is a simple or a logical conclusion. <clears throat> So let us denote this velocity, which is universal by C, which is same for all observers. Doesn't matter, depend upon whether one is moving towards this velocity or running away from it or stationary. It is a limited velocity for all observers. What does it mean? That anything which is moving with this velocity moves relative to all of the rules. <coughs> it cannot be at rest relative to any observer. So that is, the object which moves with the C is always moving. It has no state of rest. Since it can't be at rest, hence it can't, now you could say, I can't measure it mass as well. And so, another way of saying is, another way to say this velocity is unattainable to where I could say that the particle that moves with this velocity has a zero mass. 
which I is essentially saying is nobody should be able to measure, move with this velocity to measure its worth mass to be zero. <coughs> now, I, I think I can leave this aside, this little, this one slide, let's leave it, don't worry. Uh -huh. Now we say that this, such a velocity which we are, which it is same for all, where can in nature we find it? Where does it exist? Or what, what kind of a motion should it be? So let us come to the, the very basic question of defining motion. So we know motion is of two kinds. One is like particles, like all of us are like a particle, where we all move from one point in space to the other point. And so particle can be held at rest, which has a non-zero rest mass. <coughs> and if you give it energy, its velocity can keep on changing. So that is so, so a particle we can give arbitrary velocity. Depends on what, how much energy do you give it. <clears throat> now the other kind of motion we know is a wave-like motion, which is a positive dual to the particle. In particle, the same thing moves from one point to the other. In the wave, no same thing moves from one to the other. It is a cooperative motion, an element of a medium transfers the momentum to the next element, the next element, the next element. It is like on a construction site, you see people are standing at a different site and they are uh, transferring a bucket from one to the other. So water ultimately gets transferred in the bucket, but nobody from, no, no one moves from one to the other. So we, <coughs> the wave. Now, wave cannot be localized, so we cannot measure its mass. Wave by definition is never at rest. It's wave. Its characteristic is motion. It has to move. <clears throat> Second thing is, you cannot give an arbitrary velocity to a wave. Wave's motion is that property of the medium in, in which it propagates. So, for example, <clears throat> you, you can do this experiment. You go to a water pond throw a little stone, a water wave starts moving. Throw a bigger stone, another wave starts propagating. Now, if I ask the question, <clears throat> do the both waves move with the same velocity, or does the one with the, produced by the heavier, uh, stone moves faster. The, those who give answer yes to this, they should go and really do this experiment. And you will see that the both ways move with the same speed. But then you might say that by throwing bigger stone, I gave more energy. Where has that gone? That doesn't go in increasing the speed of the wave, but it goes in increasing the magnitude of oscillation of the water elements. So for the wave, its motion, its speed is determined by the medium in which it propagates. So now <clears throat> we were asking, looking for a universal speed, the speed which does not depend upon uh, the, the observer. 
should be the same for all. So among these two kinds of motion, certainly that speed cannot be of a particle like, because particle can have a speed. What it could be, it could be like a, some, a wave-like motion, but we want the speed to be universal. That means this medium, medium should be universal. <clears throat> so wave velocity can only change under two circumstances changing the medium or moving the medium like if you uh, consider a wave propagating in a river then it will also pick up the flow velocity of the river now the thing is the you know the the velocity will be the wave velocity will be Universal will be the same for all if both these things we are unable to do. That is, can we have a medium which can neither be changed and nor be moved? So any, any wave that will propagate in such a medium which cannot be changed or cannot be moved is a, will, will have the universal velocity. <coughs> Such a medium, let's call it universal medium. By which we, what we mean is, medium which is present everywhere. Since it is present everywhere, it cannot be changed. And since, it, for the same reason, since it is present everywhere, it cannot be moved. Because if you, anything which you want to move, then it should have a, some well-defined boundary, which you, pick up and push it. And so that a medium which is present everywhere is universal and there is a wave that propagates in this. It cannot, can't be changed or not move. So such a universal medium <coughs> we call vacuum. So that is to say a wave that propagates in vacuum will have a universal speed. It will be the same for all. Now putting this other way around, we should say other way around, that our universality of space and time demands that there must exist a universal speed and that can only have happen for by a wave propagating in vacuum. So our statement would be that we make a prediction: there must exist a wave that propagates in vacuum, which will have universal velocity. So here we make a very profound prediction. In Independent of electromagnetic theory or Maxwell's uh, equations, that our simple logic demands that there must exist a wave in vacuum so as to give us universal velocity to bring space and time on the same footing. This is a very, so from a very simple logic, with no mathematics or no physics, no much of, it's a simple common sense argument to tell, tells you that the, there must exist a wave that propagates in vacuum. <coughs> this is a, why, oh, sorry. This is a profound prediction. <clears throat> now let us say this. So I, I had uh, in the uh, byline to my title was, had I been born in 1844? But now let us be a little more realistic. This, that won't be you saying, uh, uh, 
big talk, small mouth. Let me put Einstein in 1844. Had Einstein been born in 1844? <coughs> then the way we are arguing, he could have very well argued like this. And in 1870, when he was 26 years old, exactly the same age in 1905, when he discovered special relativity, he would have made this profound thing that we need there there must exist a uniform uh, the universal speed uh, given by the wave propagating in vacuum and the existence of that universal speed we require a new mechanics and that new mechanics couldn't have been anything other than special relativity so Special relativity could have, in principle, been discovered in 1870 had Einstein been born in 1844. If that would have happened, that would have been great. This would have preceded Maxwell's electrodynamics. And it would be really the most remarkable thing. However, that's what that's how what that chronology did not happen. What we had was first we had the uh, Maxwell's electrodynamics, who in 1875 synthesizing Coulomb, even Pierre and Faraday, and then adding his ingenious displacement current that gave to the rise to the electromagnetic theory and those pre great prediction was that electromagnetic wave propagates in vacuum. So so the way so what we have by a simple logic demanded there must exist a wave that propagates in vacuum that gets ultimately identified with light or electromagnetic wave. <clears throat> Following the Maxwell equations, soon Hertz, Michelson and Morley actually experimentally measured this. Now, if this prediction would have been <coughs> uh, uh, that Special relativity would have been discovered in 1870. It would have been most remarkable. And five years later, the critical thing, the wave propagating in vacuum, would have been experimentally verified and identified with the, with the velocity of light, the light wave. It would have been most remarkable. But that didn't happen. First Maxwell came, then you there was a conflict between Maxwell and the classical mechanics. And then it took a time of Lorenz, Poincaré and others. Finally, uh, Einstein gave the special relativity. <coughs> but this, this would have been the if this had happened, this would have been most remarkable. <coughs> so what really happened? We had a so in another way of saying is the new mechanics or the special relativity could come the universal idea of mechanics valid for both massive and massless part. So the light could be also treated as a, a particle with zero mass, the photons. And special relativity does this synthesis. So it's now <coughs> synthesizes. Now that there is a universal velocity which binds space and time together. So we now live 
in a four dimensional space time. Not in space, not in time, but in a four dimensional space time. So this is a, a paradigm shift from the Newtonian space and one dimensional time to a four dimensional manifold space time. <clears throat> like space and time merge together, here mass, energy, and momentum are related through a quadratic relation. They are, they are not independent, they are joined together. Mass, energy, and momentum are related. And you have a light cone defining causal connection between, between the events. That is, <clears throat> So you have seen, all of must have seen this, uh, this picture on any textbook or any discussion of space on relativity. So you have at the origin is the uh, t equal to zero. Then that upper light cone is the future of this event, that all events lying inside this light cone are future of this, of the zero event. All light cones lying in below the, the, the past light cone are all in, in past of the zero event. Events which lie outside that thing, outside these light cones, we have no causal connection. So the velocity of light defines the causality line. <coughs> that, that is that only the things which move with velocity less than the velocity of light, those events can be causally connected. Events which lie outside have no causal connection because for their causal connection will require velocity and latency. So you have this, <coughs> so you have a synthesis of space time and of course the famous relation E equal to mc square. Probably I have not written this, but that uh, it's a consequence of this mass, energy, and momentum relation. Its particular case is A equal to MC squared, where mass and energy are set. Okay. Let's ask the next question. <laughs> that space and time were two universal things, which we have synthesized, bound them together through another universal uh, entity, the velocity of light, is there anything else universal which could also be, should also be brought together, should be synthesized with the basic entity space-time. So Newton tells us gravity, all particles <coughs> affected by gravity. So the question then is, should we let us also universalize gravity? Like we universalize So, uh, universalization of Newtonian mechanics led us to special relativity. Now let's ask, what did their universalization, what did we do? The, in the Newtonian mechanics, we only consider the motion of the massy particles. Universalization means we also should consider the, include the massless particles. Similarly, in the Newtonian gravity, we only consider the massive objects. 
that all objects in the universe, massive objects, are tracked each other through the inverse square law. So now the question here is how far about universalizing Newtonian gravity? Or that universalizing mean the inclusion of the zero mass particle. <clears throat> so massive the Newton already has, so we should also include the massless particle. Or which in other way to say that light must also feel gravity. Light is massless, so so far in the Newtonian gravity, light feels no gravity. It moves in a straight line. Now, so now if you want to universalize this, include the massless particle, then what happens? Now that for the inclusion of massless particle, there is a one very serious problem. How do we make a massless particle feel gravity? Because massless particles, velocity is constant, universal. You cannot change its velocity because that is, that is its, but yet it must feel gravity. Now, we all know that whenever a force acts on a particle, how do we know whether force is acting on a something? By simply seeing the change in its motion. That is the only way we know whether some force is acting on a particle or not. Now, <clears throat> massless particle, its motion cannot change. It is universal. The same velocity, its velocity cannot change, or its speed cannot change, then how can a force act on it? Because the action of the force requires that its speed must change. But here, its identity is that its speed cannot change, yet it must feel gravity. So here, this is the basic contradiction in terms we have. We have a massless particle, we want to include massless particle that it must feel gravity, but it's by nature, its speed cannot change. And if gravity has to be universal, then the massless particle must also feel gravity. So, this is a, a big contradiction we face. How do we resolve? Whenever such fundamental, at a basic level, we have a contradiction, what we must do is, we must try to forget everything that we have learned. And try to think out of the box afresh from a clean set. So let us, let us try to do something like this. <coughs> no, that should be something in the, oh. So, uh, <coughs> so let, 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 let me, oh, as, as my introduction, it was told that I come from a small village in Pakistan. So I go back to my village and ask one of the illiterate, my farmer friends, this problem. That look, in physics, we have a very profound problem. That, <clears throat> and so I wanted somebody who is not corrupted by any education, so he's illiterate, who only uses one's robust common sense, and nothing unadulterated common sense. So I asked this question that the light or photon must feel gravity, that means gravity must act on it, but its speed cannot change. 
And so far as we know, whenever gravity or any force acts on in, uh, anything, its speed changes. Now, how do we resolve this problem? So he scratches his beard and goes into a little slumber. Then he asks me, my dear friend, I don't understand what you say. Now, tell me in a simple term, what do you like or what do you want photon or light to do to feel gravity? By feeling gravity means what? What do you want it to do? So then I tell him that look, if there is such a massive object here, and a, if a photon is grazing past it, then <clears throat> instead of going straight, like all other particles, this should also bend. It should sort of Acknowledge this presence and uh, tilt a bit. So this, that is what we would like it to do. So he again goes into a slumber. And after a little while, he wakes up with a twinkle in his eyes. He says, is that all what you want? I said, if, if you give me an answer to this question, it is my name after Newton. So he said, okay, let's go to the riverside. We go to the riverside. He picks up a piece of wood, tosses into the river. It starts floating. And he said, look, it started floating. He said, yeah, the river is floating. He said, and as we walk around, the river bends, and then he said, look, this piece of wood has bent. I said, yeah, it bent because the river bent. So then he very mystically asked me to say, have you got the answer to your question? And the dumb as I am, I said, no. Then he said, my dear friend, why are you wasting your time? You are no good to do anything meaningful. Better look up, look after my cows around here. <coughs> Just a second. <coughs> yeah. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So then he asked the question that, look, where does your light float? I said it floats, floats in space. Then where is the problem? Why can't you bend the bloody space? And that's when it dawns on me that the only way light or photon can feel gravity that gravity must bend the space and photon or light freely floats in it and follow the geometry of the curved space. Now this, this is the remarkable, this is the most profound thing we could say. And again by very simple thing, now what you say is that when you bend space, and space and time we are already bound together. So what we have is that is the gravity or the matter must curve space time. And in this curved space time, whether massive or massless particles simply freely float. They follow the geometry or what we call the geodesy. Or they follow the straight line paths relative to this curved space time, and which is the more sophisticated term for the geodesics. So, the, the matter curves the space time, and the 
matter particles in this um, move along the geodesics. Like the famous statement of John Wheeler, matter tells space-time how to curve and space-time tells matter how to move. So the solution to that profound contradiction was that gravity can only be described by curvature of space-time. And that theory is, is a new theory of gravitation where gravity is described by the space-time curvature called general, general relativity. This is the greatest feat of human thought. So spoke great Paul Dirac, Dirac that amongst all the theories, and it's fantastic. So now what to capture back, to get the impact of this, is the same had Einstein discovered special relativity in 1870, that would have been a same degree of, same kind, same kind of a profound discovery and prediction that what he did in 1915, General Relativity. Why is this? Because nobody was actually asking for a new theory of gravity. As a matter of fact, the real the action was in the development of quantum theory, the atomic physics. Einstein withdraws from this after doing a one little piece of work that was good enough to win a Nobel Prize and divorced 10 years to develop a theory or new theory of gravitation which was not asked for. As a matter of fact, if we go by the observation of the serious experiment till about mid-19 1960s, one would not have seriously asked for the new theory of gravity. So, lies on the fact that he gave out the theory, developed the theory when it was not asked for. And most importantly, the theory gave you a new paradigm, which no other physics demands that the space-time itself has to describe its dynamics. Such a demand no other force makes on space-time. I think I should stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was such exciting. And uh, now uh, it's open for discussion. Anybody can uh, uh, unmute yourself and ask uh, questions. Uh, good evening, sir. Yes. So I have a question. Yeah. Like uh, in uh, uh, Einstein's uh, uh, theory of relativity, we know that why uh, time travel is only a one-way travel. Sorry, what? Why uh, time travel is a one-way travel? Why can't we uh, travel back? Oh, why can't we travel back? <coughs> well, so. The, 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 that's a very the basic and uh, profound question. The uh, ans answer to that is we really don't know. So all what we have is that we have a, however our equations of physics are time symmetric. But why the space time, the, uh, the arrow is uh, in one direction, of which there are several uh, uh, several arguments, not really a clear identity. It's like a there is a the the universe. You can attach an arrow of time with the expansion of the universe. You can attach an arrow of time to thermodynamic arrow the entropy increase. Now this is only, it doesn't explain why that happened, 
but this is only saying yes these are the certain phenomena which could be which mimic the one directional uh, uh, development of time so the, the answer to that is we really don't know yes, Anybody else, you can also unmute and ask. Sir. Morning, sir, am I audible? Yeah, yes. you are audible, you can yes. ask. Yeah. Uh, yes. Sir, I, uh, I wanted to ask, why do we think that space and time are related? Why do we think that space and time are related? So, okay, I, you see, I started in, uh, from the, in the beginning that the uh, with the concept of universality and uh, I defined a, I gave you a very simple criteria for universality that's something which is same for all and equally same the space and time satisfy that condition that they are same for all and it, equally uh, uh, equally shared hence they are universal and since they are both universal they must also be related through universal so that it is the universality of the space space and time demands that they must be related okay sir thank you <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Sir, so actually, so far in my knowledge, our knowledge that the neutrino recently is not very far away from right now. Uh, the neutrino has exceeding the speed of light. The neutrino almost zero particle. So is that difference between photon and neutrino? Should have difference, but how? How in which in which way it is difference? Observe. Neutrino and photon. Neutrino is right now certainly yes. uh, in our knowledge that it is exceeding the velocity of light. Yeah. So the answer, to that, yeah, the answer to that is, is should be that neutrino should have a mass. Yeah, mass. yeah. Like like photon, almost like photon. No, so photon has an absolute exactly. Zero have a mass to that. Something like that. No, uh, so I mean, I, photon has a zero mass. Neutrino uh, has a small mass. But you yes, don't almost have, zero. Oh, uh, almost zero. But not okay. here. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Anybody else? Good evening, sir. Yes. Sir, do the expansion of space affects the time arrow or anything? Not, not time, it doesn't affect the time arrow, well, but, but you're saying that with the expansion of the universe, we can uh, uh, associate a time arrow to that. That, that, that as, the, as time progresses, the universe expands. So this is an association. So like, but what you want, you want a, something which keeps on increasing. So expansion increasing, similarly the uh, thermodynamic will entropy of the universe increases. So you can associate a time arrow with the entropy uh, so the so Is it like uh, the speed of light is constant, so if the time is expanding, so was the space just to make the ratio constant? As you described, c equal to space by time. Right. So if space, if time is expanding, matlab time is increasing the actual time, uh, yes. the thermodynamic time, or uh, so the if time is expanding, so must the space just to make the ratio constant. Is it like that? Uh, no, no, not really, because that. that we, 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 this is if that was the case that the, the space is expanding with the speed of time, the uh, speed of light. No, if the space is not so space. The universe is expanding, but not with the speed of light. Okay. 
Actually, the, you, you know that it, it, it is decelerating and accelerating, so it doesn't, it's, it's not uh, expanding, it's uh, with a, a uniform speed. <coughs> Sir, do the expanding universe actually affects the light as uh, mentioned that uh, uh, medium affects the wave traveling? No, so, so uh, no, it uh, affects in this sense, it doesn't affect its motion. What it affects is that uh, it, it uh, the, its frequency gets red shifted. So it is more another way of looking at this. It's like a Doppler effect. You can also use that. That uh, you, 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 suppose you are standing on a platform, and a, a train is approaching you. As it whistles, and it is approaching when the it is whistling, then its frequency increases. Its pitch goes high and as it passes by you and still the, the, the same vision is on then its frequency decreases it dies out so the Doppler effect like similarly the in expanding universe the galaxy which is running away from us light coming from that will be red shifted its frequency will be decreasing so red shifting in your viewboard thing, the wavelength going towards the red, shifts towards the red. So that that is the physical effect in the, of the expanding universe uh, we have, we made that. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Thank you. Sir, good evening, sir. Yes. Sir, uh, what about other three forces? Gravity, as you said, general relativity uh, attach, uh, relates yes. gravity with space and time. Yes. So, what about other three forces? Like, uh, I have read that the fifth dimension is might be there and uh, electromagnetic waves may, may be the vibrations from fifth dimension. So, what about these two forces and uh, these three forces? <coughs> so. So, this, so we, truly that we have these four forces right now, you know, of which the gravity is one which is different from the other three, that the gravity demands space-time to describe its geometry. And the reason for that is the gravity is universal. That is, it links to all parts, it affects everything. All other three forces, they are affected by a, to a part, particular kind of particles. So like for the electric force, only affects the particle which has electric charge. Neutral particle, it doesn't affect. And similarly, your weak and strong, which are the nuclear forces, they also have their specific charges on each one. So, more interesting question would be, so like here, the gravity could be described by the geometry of space-time. Similarly, whether the other three forces, could they also be described by the geometry of some particular species? And the answer to that is probably yes. So, for example, about the electric field, it's little involved, but we can say that in electric field, the case is described by the geometry of the fiber bundle space, which is uh, can be attached to every point in space time. And the curvature of that defines the, the Maxwell field. And the other two forces are much more involved in the subtle in the nuclear, uh, nuclear forces, which we really do not understand so very well. 
in the space time geometry. About your question about the fifth dimension thing, yes, there have been studies about. Uh, so, one thing which you particularly were talking about, there was a theory of Kaluja Kaline, due to Kaluja Kaline, where the electromagnetic field coming from the fifth dimension. So, that theory was, it was a very interesting good theory, but it does not ultimately synthesize electromagnetic and gravity. It does not give you a, a fully satisfactory theory. But on the other hand, there have been a, uh, like the string theory, which had uh, always lived in higher dimensions. And gravity, people do believe that it probably does not remain entirely confined to four dimensions. And could we have it? But how those the the main question is how the higher dimensional effects are brought to the four dimensional space time we still do not know. Because we understand things, we do the experiment only in four dimensions. Yes. <coughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir, how can we draw four-dimensional object? Well, you cannot draw. But drawing even the three dimension is not very meaningful. But yes. But sir, we can show as in a paper. But how can we show four-dimensional object on a paper? So you have to see something that. So one way of probably is that you you can see your what you have. Helical thing. You see that time always move. So one direction things will always keep on moving, and the other space thing probably can uh, circle around this. Some well, some picturization of that. Okay, sir. Thank you. Uh, I will ask one question. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. So you started this lecture by attributing this lecture to Professor Rao Ch Rai So can you yeah. just explain it in very popular terms? Uh, what is uh, what is, is the main is the Rai Chaudhary equation? What it tries to address? Uh, something. Okay. So Rai Chaudhary equation is this uh, essentially. Uh, sorry, I should have had something else. But then, so j <coughs> just consider. Uh, a number of particles parallelly moving under gravity. And so, Dai Chaudhary will tell the equation tells you how its dynamics, how it evolves. And it evolves because of their self gravity, it, it converges. These particles, parallelly moving particles in free space, they will come come together, come closer, they converge. And so that is, so what it, it tells you that you started with a, a particular area of the cross-section of the, these uh, 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 the particle rays, and this area goes on decreasing as, as you and what it is ultimate thing which ultimately uh, were responsible for all these powerful theorems which Hawking and Penrose could uh, prove about their uh, similarity. And that is that they will converge such that ultimately you will have a similar state that that curvature will become infinite. So that's some. Now this was a, the hint of that in there. The Hawking and Penrose that was later on proved this very rigorously under very general conditions. That in general relativity, which is to say under gravity, they will always occur as similarity. 
if you were considering a collapse of any object, it ultimately will produce a similarity. And Penrose thought that before that happens, there will be a black hole or event horizon will be formed. So the important thing was the seminal work was the Reichel equation for this famous Hawking Penrose similarity theorem. Anybody else? <coughs> okay, so if uh, no other questions are there, I would like to thank Professor Naresh Tadich to have uh, come to us and uh, explained uh, relativity in such uh, simpler terms through logic. It was so well elegantly explained. I think now uh, all of you have uh, an idea about uh, what this uh, theory tries to convey. I thank you, sir for having thank come you. here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, bye. Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you for the interesting session, sir. Thank you. Thank you thank so you. much, sir. Thank you. Okay. 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 <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you, sir.